The politics and ethics of lockdown. Is our most populated city doing enough to protect a largely unvaccinated nation? And who is paying the greatest price? Welcome to Q&A. And welcome to the program. I'm David Spears, host of Insiders, filling in for Hamish McDonald, who is hoping to be out of lockdown and back with you soon. Great to be with you live from Melbourne. And joining me on the panel tonight, journalist and filmmaker Santilla Chinga Ipe, Liberal member for Higgins, Katie Allen, who is a paediatrician and public health researcher before entering politics. World renowned philosopher Peter Singer, the associate editor of The Australian, Cameron Stewart, who's just returned home from the United States. And in Darwin, Labor Senator for the Northern Territory, Malandiri McCarthy. Please, make them all feel welcome. <laughs> well, you can stream us live on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please join the debate from home. Our first question is a video and comes from Karen Tam, who is in lockdown in Sydney. The New South Wales government says they are following the best health advice. Yet every day we are seeing high case numbers and cases that have been in the community while infectious. Would it not have been more effective to have locked down Sydney earlier? Even now, large retail chains remain open when they have online presence and delivery capability. This gives an avenue for people to move around, thereby curtailing any large reduction in community cases. Shouldn't further restrictions be introduced now for this last week of lockdown? Katie Allen, let me go to you first on this. You've lived through tougher lockdowns in Melbourne, obviously. Do you think New South Wales, uh, the Premier Gladys Berejiklian, should have gone earlier and harder with this lockdown? Look, I think, David, Karen's question is one that faces, you know, everybody mm. around the globe and you need to look at the decisions and the balance that a government is making. And, you know, I really back in Gladys's decision-making to this point. She would have been making that decision with her Cabinet uh, apprised of the fact that they've got a crack COVID contact tracing team, but they've also got shifting sands if you look at the Delta variant and you also look at the compliance in the community. Um, I think things are changing and so you could say we could have done this, but they're balancing lives and livelihoods and that's a difficult balance to make and I think if it was for free, you know, if you didn't have the emotional and economic consequences of a lockdown, I'm sure they probably would have locked down earlier, but you have to balance those many difficult things in the one decision making and that risk balance ratio is why we look to our governments to make those decisions. They're not easy. No, they're not easy decisions, uh, but with 38 cases recorded yesterday, 11 of them were in the community while they were infectious. Um, there, there are still, you know, no restrictions on how far people can travel across Sydney. You know, shops like florists and designer handbag stores are still open. I mean, do, do you think this is really gold standard when it comes to this Delta variant? Well, I actually think that we are seeing around the world a change in the risk balance ratio. And, you know, I know that we uh, have a little way to go with regards to the vaccination um, uptake. But what I would say is we are seeing high rates of vaccination in our most vulnerable population. And I've always argued that the targets should be around preventing deaths because we know that the vaccine is most effective in preventing deaths. It's not actually that is as effective in preventing cases and we don't really know whether it's good at preventing infections. So we really want to make sure we don't have deaths from COVID. And so uh, we are getting high rates, more than 70% of the over 70 year olds are now vaccinated. That is where the deaths mm. occur. So that's where I think we're seeing a change in the balance in the equation. And we're seeing countries like Singapore making different decisions. And I think Australia needs to have that conversation. And I think we're going to come to the vaccination debate, but Cameron, let me come to you because you've just come back from the United United States. It's a very different approach to COVID in Australia. Uh, and, and each lockdown, we, we do see, you know, an inevitable debate about whether it should have happened sooner, later, harder, weaker. What have you made of how New South Wales and Gladys Berejiklian in particular is handling this outbreak? Look, I think um, New South Wales has generally uh, tended to be more reluctant to lock down quickly than the other states. And I've always thought that that's a better approach. Um, where this goes from here, who really knows? Uh, but it's certainly been... Uh, it's certainly a vastly different approach to, to this whole pandemic. Um, 
in the United States and the experience of the US versus Australia, um, you know, where I've spent the last four years in the US. And really, uh, over there, uh, you know, they, they got it all wrong last year. They absolutely mucked it up from the White House downwards. Uh, and Australia got it right. I remember being in Washington, um, feeling quite proud and envious of Australia's ability to uh, not, um, you know, to, to do much better than the rest of the world in relation to the pandemic last year. Uh, but now it seems that the tables have almost completely turned. In the US, uh, the US is almost awash with vaccines. Most people in America over the age of 12 who wants a vaccine can have it. The country is free. It's flying around. There's no lockdowns. They can even go to Europe. Britain in a week's time will unhatch <coughs> the country as well. Here in Australia, our largest city is locked down. Uh, our second largest city, Melbourne, was locked down a few weeks ago. Uh, Brisbane locked down as well. And so really, um, you know, the, the contrast is, is very vast and with the vaccines... But, but just on that, I mean, people aren't dying in Australia. No, Certainly, that's right. you know, compared to those countries you mentioned, the US and the UK, sure, they may be opening up. They've still got plenty of COVID. And plenty of deaths. Mm. And plenty of deaths. Mm. No, they have, well, not that many deaths, compared, obviously, compared to what there was. Uh, but still proportionally, you know, it's, it's, it's much, much better over there. The freedom is coming. Uh, I'm not saying that that should be the case now. I think that, that Sydney has to lock down under the circumstances. But it's very frustrating that Australia is so far behind the eight ball with timing on this stuff. Peter, I mean, you've witnessed these lockdowns since the pandemic be began. And, and certainly here in Melbourne, we went through a very long one last <coughs> year. They have been debated each time. Um, do you think it is becoming clearer whether lockdowns and how they're applied, uh, you know, the rights and wrongs, going early, going hard. Is that becoming more straightforward as to what should be done by premiers? I think it is clearer, and I think it's clear that the Victorian lockdowns, which were much tougher and went earlier, and the recent one went early but was fairly short, have worked better than what the New South Wales government has been doing, where I think they have been too soft and too slow, uh, and now they're getting the consequences of it. Uh, and... I think you can't really make the comparison with the United States or the UK because we have a chance of eliminating the virus. As we, you know, in Victoria, we haven't had any local cases of transmission for the last eight days. Um, whereas, you know, th there's no chance in Europe or, or the United States that they are going to eliminate the virus. They have to get out of it through vaccination. Uh, I agree that we've done quite badly in terms of vaccination um, and we are lagging far behind. But um, still, you know, it, we, we're better off in, in having very few or, in some cases, zero cases. Uh, and we can achieve that with these tough, short lockdowns and with better quarantine, which is the other thing we've stuffed up. If we had more remote quarantine stations, um, we wouldn't have the same high risk of the leakages that we're having into the larger community. Just, just on the point you raised there about um, pursuing zero cases, it still seems a little fuzzy in New South Wales as to whether that's what is being pursued here, zero community transmission. I know this was asked a number of times at the Premier today. Is it, is it clear now that's what we should be pursuing? Um, well, Katie Allen, just back to you on that. Look, I think there has been um, in Victoria this concept, I think, um, unsaid concept about going for, um, you know, complete elimination. And I think that, that the Premier never quite said that, but some of his public health servants mm. did. Um, he wasn't straight with the community about that. So I think there was a, a, a dissonance between what National Cabinet, with all the Premier's and territory leaders and the Prime Minister were saying inside that room and then coming out and we're getting a dissonance with regards to that. And I think that it's actually naive to think that we would eliminate COVID. I think that's actually a very public health naive approach. And that is not the conversation that the National Cabinet has had with the Australian public. And I think it's actually unfair when but, people But it are... has been the case in, in different states for quite long periods of time. We still continue to have people returning home from overseas. Ah, exactly. That's, that's right. And right? if we had And what you're quarantine... suggesting is unconstitutional. You're saying citizens should not be allowed to return to Australia? Is that what you're saying? No, just, I'm, just saying, I'm saying they should return to Australia, but we should have, like Howard Springs, which, as I understand it, hasn't leaked. Absolutely. We, we, should, we should have... Thank you. Yeah, you, you would know much <laughs> more about that, of course, Senator. Absolutely. I agree with you, Peter. Yeah. Absolutely. Senator, I'll come, Let... Senator, I'll come yeah. to you in just a moment. I just want to be clear about this <laughs> point. Um, the, many of the states have effectively pursued zero COVID. Community outbreaks, which is very different. You still get outbreaks, but they try to um, squash them and get down to zero in the community. I've always said from the very get-go that quarantining is a human interface. And I've been on the board of a local hospital and every human interface has accidents. Just sure. a fact of life. 350,000 people when they coming happen. through... 
quarantine facilities, um, 3,500 of those being COVID positive, and knowing that the incubation period for COVID is longer than 14 days in one in 100 cases, it's naive to think it's not going to leak. And the, the Howard Springs uh, quarantining facilities had <coughs> rapid antigen testing. That is what is distinctly different from the other forms of quarantining. So there are many things that we can continue to improve with regards to quarantining, and we should. Yeah, and I think we've got a few But we've always got to have here. many layers of yeah. protection. It's not one thing that's going to have sorted this I've, out. There's a few issues in the mix here, and quarantine's one of them. But when there is an outbreak, like we have in Sydney at the moment, should a lockdown persist until there is zero community transmission? Well, actually, when the last lockdown occurred in Melbourne, the messaging that came from the state government was, we will lock down until we get control of contact tracing. That's what they said. Mm. Until we get control of contact tracing. Okay. Now, so they are in charge of knowing what their numbers are. They are in charge of knowing how much their crack teams are going out there and actually mm. getting control of it. And they also understand the community consent to doing that as well. And that is changing as we speak, as is the expectations of what can be achieved and what is achieved. Senator, is it clear to you whether pursuing zero community transmission is or should be the goal? David, what's clear to me is that uh, here in the Northern Territory, we were the first to lock down immediately at the beginning of the pandemic because we were conscious of the vulnerabilities here in the Territory. And only last week, we immediately locked down with the Tanami gold mine outbreak. So clearly, and locking down is important if we want to eliminate the issue at hand straight away. And we've shown that, and we've also shown that in terms of the quarantine facility that we have here. Why hasn't the federal government rolled out a similar style Howard Springs quarantine facility in the city, capital cities across Australia? Well, it's a, it's a question that's constantly raised and... Well, I don't know if, it, Katie Allen, you wanted to respond to that. Yeah, I do, actually. Um, and, and are you asking that we st stand down the hotel quarantining system as well? Well, the hotel quarantine system is clearly not working, is it? I haven't uh, heard Katie? one politician suggest that we close them down. Are you suggesting we close down hotel quarantine well, tomorrow? Well, those hotel no, when, quarantine when, systems when we have are more, for more tourists. Just, uh, yeah. I mean, we'll really. just let the senator respond to that. Sorry, Sorry. Senator McCarthy. So, so what I'm saying, Katie, is that uh, the coalition government in 2007 was able to, and I use this as an example logistically, was able to roll out over 200 demountables right across the Northern Territory in remote regions of the Northern Territory under the Northern Territory intervention and yet it is very incapable of rolling out across the capital cities, which are not in rural and remote areas of Australia, a quarantine system very similar to the Howard Springs facility. There is no urgency to this government in wanting to ensure that we have the most appropriate quarantine facilities for all Australians and for those Australians who want to come back from overseas. Let's well, move to our next question. We've got a few on the whole uh, pandemic, and not surprisingly, comes from Vaughan Sketcher. Canada has been immunising 12 to 17 year olds with Pfizer for the last couple of months. Assuming Australia can procure an adequate supply of this vaccine in the near future, I feel torn between wanting my 13 year old asthmatic son protected from the more contagious variants of COVID and the inequity of lower socioeconomic groups not having access to vaccines. My question tonight is for Mr Singer. If you were in my situation, what would you choose? Peter. Probably if I were in your situation, I would try to get my asthmatic son vaccinated because obviously uh, asthma is a serious risk here with COVID. So he is at, at high risk. Um, and I think we ought to be vaccinating people in accordance with their risk, which normally will mean older people get vaccinated because they're at high risk. But people with underlying medical conditions that make it more likely that they will die or suffer very serious illness if they get COVID should also be vaccinated. Um, I certainly think that you know, uh, vulnerable people in the community generally should be vaccinated and clearly it would be good if we had a lot more vaccines to do that. But uh, I can well understand any parent wanting a child with an underlying condition like that to want them to be vaccinated. I should point out that COVID vaccines have not been approved in Australia for um, anyone under the age of 16 at the moment. But more broadly, it does raise an interesting question. Santilla, what do you think? Um, the, the ethics of... Having a vaccine uh, here in Australia, whether it's for your child or for yourself, um, or whether you know, we should look at countries like Indonesia that are absolutely ravaged with COVID right now and need vaccines, should we be willing to sacrifice our own jab for someone in a poorer country? Mm. 
I don't think it's either or. I think we can do both. I think, um, and I'd be interested to hear Peter's perspective on this actually in terms of, um, you know, the equitable vaccine distribution. But I certainly think that, you know, if you have a choice between being vaccinated and being safe in your community, take that option. Mm. But also, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking about how else we can help people that are more vulnerable. And certainly, we do know that with infectious diseases, you know, if there is um, a virus somewhere in some corner of the world, it might reach us as well. So it doesn't protect us just because we are vaccinated um, from potential, uh, from the virus getting to our shores. So I definitely think that... Were you going to say something? No, no, no. I was just going to say, it, it, ideally, yes, there would be plenty to go around for both here and, and in every country. Um, UNICEF has said there's a COVID vaccine shortfall of around 190 million doses. Uh, a report by The Economist says uh, uh, more than 85%, 85 poor countries won't have widespread access to vaccines until 2023, if at all. So there is a shortage. There is. And I think that it raises bigger questions that our government um, hasn't really given any clarity on. I mean, the conversation that just happened 10 minutes ago was in some ways symbolic of what's been going on. You know, there's been p poor communication about, you know, the strategy going forward, what that looks like domestically, but also in terms of our obligations internationally when it comes to dealing with this pandemic. And certainly the equitable dis distribution of vaccines is important. We do know that, you know, countries that are more vulnerable aren't getting the vaccines. Um, the Australian government, you know, we're last in a lot of things at the moment internationally, but in terms of even, you know, uh, giving the waiver to the patients to allow some of the developing and middle-income countries countries to be able to actually produce these vaccines to make sure that, you know, they can reach these communities quicker and cheaply, we're, we're, we're blocking that. You know, China, well, Russia... Well, the, the government has said we're looking at it. We're looking at supporting that vaccine. Well, program. I mean, at some point when you've got, you know, countries like China, the US and Russia making a commitment saying that this is the right thing to do because we recognise that we are in, you know, unprecedented circumstances and you can't sort of mm. conduct yourself the way that you normally would because lives are at risk. And I think that for the most part, we tend to really be quite insular with how we look at these sorts of things. Um, and we turn our eyes on some of these communities because we're sort of used to sort of seeing them suffer. Um, and this is a perfect example of it. We're, we're, we're more concerned with, with our own lives than of others. But, at, you know, in, <laughs> with, the, with, with this pandemic, you know, ensuring equitable access is not just a moral, ethical issue, it's a public health issue as well. Well, in, indeed, it is a public health issue. Uh, Peter Singer, what, what do you think about this and, and the ethics of... Yes, Taking the vaccine here versus giving it to someone if, else. If we're looking at what the government should be doing, I, I agree uh, exactly with what Santia was saying. I think we should be looking at the countries where the need is greatest, where large numbers of people are getting infected and dying. Um, Indonesia is, is one of those at the moment. Um, India has been in great need, but also there are many low-income countries that have very few vaccines. Um, and, and I think, in a way, it's, it's, it's difficult, I understand, but in a way we should be saying... Yes, you know, we really are one world on this and we ought to be trying to see that uh, though where the need is greatest is, is where the largest number of well, vaccines... Katie are. Allen, is there a difficulty there for uh, any government, I suppose, to sell that message to a population that very much wants vaccines? Here? Well, I think the first thing to say is that we've targeted the most vulnerable in our community. Firstly, the aged or those who are older, the most vulnerable, and then we've also targeted um, vaccination the vaccination rollout to those with disabilities, those with comorbidities and the Indigenous population but over and above. Though, I mean, we've sort of seen reports that some people in aged care have not been vaccinated. We do know that some people in Indigenous communities haven't yet been given opportunities to be vaccinated. So, so actually, I'll put that to one side because in the aged care facilities, uh, certainly everyone's been offered them. It doesn't mean they've taken them up. And that's, the, that's, that's, a, that's a moral and philosophical rub that we can talk about in a moment. But the, the, the approach has been to target those who are most vulnerable in our country and to commit to um, the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific environment in which we live. So we've made a commitment of a million vaccines to PNG and we, and we sent a lot in uh, early on when we were worried about what was happening there. We've now committed two and a half million to Indonesia and we've committed 15 million vaccines to um, our, our Pacific neighbours. So we do see this as a commitment and we do know that we've got a significant commitment um, with 150 million vaccines um, purchased and we're going to provide them at low cost uh, or no cost to our Pacific Islanders when we've 
you know, is part of our vaccination program. So we are taking on a broader responsibility. But I would like to say that AstraZeneca uh, is a vaccine that has been well taken up in the UK. And I really back in the fact that morally and ethically, uh, this company said we will provide it at cost to the developing world. And it has created or it has been providing the backbone of vaccination to the world. The World Health Organisation has backed in AstraZeneca. And I'm deeply disappointed um, about the way that the Australian population has perceived the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, two deaths, unfortunate deaths from four and a half million doses of AstraZeneca. Well, as of tonight, it's three, uh, just to clear three. that up. The target has Three, but that's the, less the, than a, one in a million, still less than one in a million. And we know that early on, the, the clots associated with Astra AstraZeneca were being mistreated by doctors. That's been rectified now. Um, but AstraZeneca as a company uh, is, has made a commitment to provide at cost to the developing world, that's something to be recognised. Sure. Are, are you saying Atagi was wrong to um, say AstraZeneca should be the preferred vaccine for people 60 years and over? I wrote to Atagi and asked them to review their um, advice um, based on the changing situation internationally um, because um, I think there is two aspects to this. Firstly, um, Atagi, um, well, the Australian government and Atagi and the TGA said from the very get-go we we're going to be open and transparent about all risks with the Australian population. You know, we do know that trust and respect comes with transparency and that we we're going to be very clear from the get-go about any side effects and any deaths. And that was a commitment that we made and have been very clear about that. But the issue is, is that ATAGI can provide advice, but at the end of the day, the government is the government that should make the decision. And um, I would have preferred that ATAGI said that there is risks and warnings, but not that they should say it should not be administered. And I think we can see now that people understand that they can receive AstraZeneca um, in these other age categories. They should speak to their doctor and, of course, have a consented process and make the decision for themselves. And should, I would just, support just to pick that, that up, though, position. Sh should the government have taken the advice from ATAGI, but as you point out, ultimately the government makes a decision. Should the government have said, we'll still make AstraZeneca available to all ages? Well, I think it's the way that the um, advice from ATAGI is being framed. I, I think that as a government, we've done the right thing by saying we'll take the evidence and we'll have an expert-informed evidence-based decision-making process. And as an empiricist and scientist myself, I really back that approach. But I also know that uh, within these committee decision processes, and I know many of the individuals in those committees, there has been a variation of opinion. And this is the thing in science. Science, like politics, is a contest of ideas. But you think and it should be available? To Europe, you, you, well, if you look to Europe, they all came up with different decisions. So there's not a clear decision about what is the best but way does this to, add to Does this add to confusion? though, if, if you're saying it's OK for... Yeah, you're right. That's why I haven't been public about it, because I don't want to add to the confusion, because I think that the public so needs to know what the risks to are, and tonight. then they listen, need to make Listen to you or listen to Atagi? Uh, well, at the end of the day, Atagi, if you look clearly at the recommendations, you can have as AstraZeneca. It's just the way it's been transmitted as information. And I have to say, uh, the media has made very clear the side effects of AstraZeneca. Right. They haven't made clear some of the other side effects of Pfizer in the same way. So, um, look, at the end of the day, I would say, please, go and get vaccinated. And to be honest, both of them are good at preventing death, and that's the point about this vaccination program. Vaughan, just quickly, does, it, does any of this uh, you've heard here clear up your dilemma about what to do? Uh, all I can think of is wouldn't it be great if we're in the position that we could do both without mm. me having to ponder these mm. ethical questions? Mm. 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 Indeed. All right, well, let's move to our next question from Ines Zeng. Hi. Um, we've just discussed uh, multiple views on uh, vaccine hesitancy, and I believe that we are currently at a turning point in our fight against the pandemic, but there's just a huge spread of hesitancy across the nation. My question to the panel is, how do you view the media's role and influence on vaccine hesitancy? Cameron Stewart, let me go to you. The, the media's role in uh, covering some of these issues and the risks of AstraZeneca in particular. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think that, if anything, the, the media where the media could be faulted in the coverage of the pandemic is probably more the sensationalist role of, of focusing on the number of, um, of, of COVID cases every day. Uh, I think that's something that, say, the British media, the American media have moved beyond that. They're focusing on hospitalisations and deaths rather than the actual number of cases. I think that's somewhere something that the Australian media could modify itself on. So um, that would actually lend itself to people being more likely to get vaccines. As far as the media's role in, in vaccine hesitancy, I haven't really noticed a lot of that. There was a lot of criticism, actually, of the, um, the Queensland Chief Health Officer when she came out with a relatively anti-vaccine message about 
10 days ago about AstraZeneca. Mm. And there was some criticism about mixed messages, which you were alluding to, Katie, um, about... Well, just to be clear, I think she was being an anti-vaxxer, but she was accused by some yes. of... Uh, you know, fueling was, that sentiment by saying those who are 18 years old correct. There was shouldn't a, take it, was, it was a message that was interpreted by some as, as making people more reluctant, young people more reluctant to take AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. And again, with the federal government, there has been some mixed messages um, around about ATAGI, about, around about the advice. So I think the media has, has, has jumped on that. So I actually haven't seen a great deal of, of um, role for the media in promoting uh, anti-vaccination, um, you know, uh, attitudes, but, you know, it, you certainly don't want to be doing that at this point in time in Australia. Melendiri McCarthy, vaccine hesitancy has been a bit of an issue in some uh, Indigenous communities as well. Why, why is that, do you think, and what do you think about the media's role here in, in covering the way and the, the risks of vaccines? I think there are two levels to that. Firstly, there was the, the messaging at the federal level, David, which uh, created a great deal of confusion. And, and just amongst political leaders, that in itself is, is one level. You then have another level in terms of uh, uh, being able to explain. So translation, here in the Northern Territory, we have over 100 Aboriginal languages, so it's important uh, that... And also, of course, with the multicultural community, Greeks, Italians, we need to make sure that uh, we had the translation as well for all of those groups. And in amidst all that, uh, the communication strategy itself uh, has been... Uh, could be much, much better. Uh, you know, the First Nations media organisations, for example, could be much better funded. They were at the beginning of COVID, but they certainly are not to the same extent in terms of the vaccination program. Now, having said that, uh, the, on the weekend, it was our people out on the ground in places like Manangrita, David, where uh, you had the elders now feeling less hesitant because of the lockdown that we'd had and the importance of getting mm. vaccinated, uh, they then went out uh, and went out in buses and got the community together. So we had a place, uh, a community of Manangrita, where we had over 400 people vaccinated in one day, which was the largest uh, community in the Northern Territory in one day. So, you know, it's... Uh, we're probably at a better stage now, uh, not as hesitant, not as cautious, but that's not to say it couldn't change if the messages get muddled up again. Well, the next question is a video and it comes from Charlie Knowles in Bali. Hi, my name is Charlie and I'm an Australian who's been stuck overseas since the beginning of the pandemic. I am fully vaccinated and I have a family of five. We'd like to come home to Australia, but we currently can't because of the caps and the price. So my question to the panel is, why is there still not a program to vaccinate Australians overseas so that we don't bring COVID into the country? And then once that's done, let us come home because we're totally safe. OK, thank you for taking my question. Mm. Well, Santilli, you've been separated from your parents since, what, before the pandemic began? Yeah, since Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Christmas, Christmas 2019. 2019. Yeah. Do you think most Australians understand the impact the border closure or the restrictions that the border have had? I don't think so. And I think this was reflected quite well in the Australia Talks survey. I think, mm. um, I think it was close to 80% of respondents essentially um, argued that we should keep our borders closed. And that, to me, speaks to a bigger um, challenge around this pandemic. And this has been highlighted by this conversation on its own. The fact that there is very... There's been poor communication by this government and by our political leaders in terms of explaining the implications of some of these measures. And also the fact that, you know, Australians are impacted very differently by this. And just closing the borders and saying, OK, um, we're keeping the virus out. Um, but what impact does that have on people that have family? What impact does that have on the economy? I mean, we, we don't know when the borders are going to be reopened. Um, I think that four-point plan, which is very vague, gave an indication that if there's some level of vaccination rate in the community, then we might look to reopen. But what does that mean in terms of how we trade with other countries? You know, tourism and education, highly dependent on those things. And we can't expect that the world's going to be open, you know, in two years' time or however long it's going to take for us to get our act together. So what should happen then, in, in your view? And, and to the point, uh, the question that Charlie raises there about fully vaccinated uh, people being allowed to travel on home quarantine. I think that one of the things that we should really be um, asking is for transparency from our leaders. I think um, I work a lot with um, the historical archive and one of the things that I think about whenever making decisions about 
um, you know, the policy of the time when, you know, when something was done, um, is was it a good decision versus was it a bad decision? And you can look at something and argue, like, for example, early on in March, last year when we had the lockdowns and when we had, you know, governments around the world car uh, carrying out similar measures, we could argue that, that those decisions were done in good faith. And the reason why was because the pandemic was quite a new thing. We knew very little about it. We didn't have any information about it. Um, and therefore, that decision from a, from a historical assessment would not be a bad decision, right? But then, 18 months on, same measures, borders closed, lockdowns, and yet we've got a body of information, you know, that is telling us about ways in which we can go about managing this and no clear long-term strategy out. I mean, we got, like, a PowerPoint presentation from mm -hmm. the government last week. Honestly, it was, like, one page unclear about what this is going to look like, and yet lives are being impacted. And I think Peter could probably speak better to this in well, terms Peter, of the well-being yeah. aspect of having people isolated from their loved ones. I think we've got a quarter of Australians either born overseas or have a family member that's born overseas. So this is close to millions of people being impacted by these measures. And some people argue, oh, you know, if we open the borders, then, you know, we're going to have, like, situations that are happening in Europe where people are dying. And it's like, well, what does that look like in terms of the long-term impacts on people that are being forced to also make the sorts of sacrifices that others, others in the community aren't being made, forced to make? Peter Singer, it is obviously creating a lot of pain for a lot of Australian families, this border restriction. Do you think it is justified? It is undoubtedly creating a lot of pain and we should be doing what we can to reduce that, eliminate it if we can, and that goes back to what we were saying before about setting up better quarantine facilities, more quarantine facilities that are really isolated from the community. But I think we have to recognise that there is a lot of pain in, in getting the virus into the community and then locking down. Um, and that is a much larger number of people and perhaps more directly affects livelihoods. Um, but in some cases, you know, there have been studies showing that it may increase mental illness, may increase domestic violence. So there are a lot of problems with having the, vi having the lockdowns. And, and that's the very difficult trade-off, I think. Um, you know, how much can we try to reduce that suffering of the people cut off from their families? But, but, uh, or the people like Charlie, who was not able to come at all. But, Peter, is, isn't this debate changing now with the, um, the more ready availability of vaccines for Australians overseas? Certainly in Europe, America and Britain, Australians can be vaccinated. Uh, I mean, you could, you could make a decision... Katie, uh, to basically require all Australians to be vaccinated before they come back to Australia. Uh, you could do that. You, they could do home quarantine for a week or so, be tested. Things are moving on. Uh, you know, th as, as you said, things are moving but on. We don't even have and that. We don't even have that plan or even that idea yes, being exactly. debated or discussed. And, I mean, and, and, all we're I, getting is we're letting the science decide and then dismissing any kind of and conversation. And this is a risk ratio sort of going... which is changing because people can be vaccinated. Australians can come back vaccinated, not pose much of a risk at all to the community. That's different to what it was only a few months ago. And I feel the debate is not moving along with that that development. Just on the movement we did see the other day, along with that four point plan was the halving of international arrivals, probably for the next six months. Katie Allen, are you happy with that? No. <laughs> um, but that's because, I mean, we're talking about this balance and um, on one side we've got, you know, pro-lockdowns and others, you know, we want to get back to connecting with the rest of the world. And, and it's somewhere in between, in my view. We need lockdowns uh, to get control of the virus. Um, we won't be able to eliminate it, but we do need to be connected with the rest of the world. It's probably worth saying there's 40,000 Australians coming and going each month. So there's a lot of people that are coming and going But at what point do we system. start having that conversation? You talked about this So earlier. we are. We're having no, no, it right no, now. No, but I need to finish my point. You talked about, you know, acceptable risk in the community. At what point do we start entertaining that conversation? where, you know, people are aware that we're not going to fully eliminate this virus and at some point we're going to have to deal with the fact that it, it, it is going to be in the community. But at the moment, the communication seems to be around we have to have zero cases. And, no, no, it and hasn't. So the Prime Minister has been very clear. Aggressive suppression has always been what he said. Aggressive suppression is the words that he's used, not elimination. So we, we do want to eliminate community spread but aggressively suppress it, knowing that it will continue to leak from quarantine, we need to try and work to stop it from leaking, but have contact tracing, physical distancing and now vaccination mm. as our next sort of level. But, but to be clear on the international arrivals, do you think the evidence was there to halve those caps? 
Well, I think it's it's sort of like the lockdown issue. I think basically people are saying we want to pull back because we don't we want to basically get back in control. It's a temporary measure. I'd like to see it um, released. I'd like to see it to go back up again. Straight and actually, away, right now? Uh, not right now because we've got this problem in Sydney. So you know, let's just get that sorted one thing at a time. And this is the problem with COVID. It's a it's a moving parts. You know, it's a, it's, it's a crisis in slow motion in some ways. And getting back to what Cameron said, what I'm advocating for within government is that we do need to move to exactly what Cameron's saying. What, what's happening in the US... Home quarantine, is, if you're fully is, vaccinated. Is, is, you know, vaccination or testing before you arrive, home quarantining. Those are, that's where we're getting to. And how we get there... You know, we've, we've, we've announced a four-point plan. I agree with you. There is not a lot of meat on the bones yet, but it's been announced. We know that, you know, we expect by November the 2nd, you know, Freedom Day, that we expect that there'll be a significant amount of vaccination, you know, delivered by that point in time. Those are the sorts of time frames that we're looking at. But, of course, COVID's been, been a bit like, you know, building a house. It's twice as expensive and takes yeah. twice as long. <laughs> well, we've got, we got to get to our next question. It's a video question from Katie Chi woman, Christine Palmer, who's currently in the ACT. I come from a community called Willora. Like many other communities around the country, we have been endlessly and helplessly communicating with the government about the status of our people. My people today are drinking uranium contaminated water. Our culture is buried under endless policies that eventuates in nothing. Now, at the time of COVID, we hear nothing about the ordeal of our people. COVID-19 has added a lot more pressure on our communities. However, yet again, I see nothing addressing the needs of our community nor the pressure during these terrible times. My question is why? Did anybody ask First Peoples in remote communities in their own language, do you want to be isolated? Well, Malandiri McCarthy, let me go to you first on this. Should remote communities have been asked, and were they asked, if they wanted to be isolated? At the beginning of the pandemic, David, uh, it was the calls from the communities to be isolated which, uh, and supported by the Aboriginal community health sector. So the ARCHOs, uh, NACHO, the national uh, body, uh, pushed for the federal government to look at the biosecurity act in terms of uh, Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal land, and if it had not come from the First Nations people, uh, we would not perhaps have seen such a quick movement to protect uh, the communities. Peter, I guess this does raise a broader question. Was anyone asked if they wanted to be locked down or whether they wanted the international border closed? Is there, uh, I guess, a role for more consultation more generally? Uh, sometimes you have to take rather quick decisions, um, as, you know, the decision we had when we learnt that the virus was coming into Australia. I think you need to make a quick decision. You certainly don't have time to spend the weeks that it would take to consult with the community. So I, I think there are justifications for taking yeah. quick decisions. Um, and then if you do have time, certainly then you can consult and see what, what people want. But uh, you, sometimes you need quick action. The, the Senator referenced Pat Turner there, you know, her views on what, the steps taken early in the pandemic. But uh, more recently, just this week, Pat Turner was not invited to this wargaming meeting on the vaccine rollout. Um, Katie Allen, do you think that was an oversight? Probably. Uh, David, I might uh, just step in there if I can. Uh, I spoke to Pat Turner about that today and uh, they, they were involved. I think it was more around the language that was used in terms of wargaming. I just want to make it clear to your viewers that uh, the Aboriginal community health sector were the first to call for uh, being on the COVID advisory group back in March last year and they have met uh, fortnightly, sometimes weekly, and they continue to meet. Uh, but they called it the COVID advisory group and when uh, the general... Uh, came on board and uh, changed the name to War Game. I think it caused uh, great concern, and I think we need to realise that again. That was the messaging, mm. and and not very clear messaging. All right, good to clear that up. Can so, I add? There yeah. is. I mean, I sit on National Response, COVID Response Committee, and um, from the very get go, an Indigenous population was front and centre with regards to, you know, we needed to make sure that we protected a community that is so vulnerable that if it got in, that it could just rip through. And so I think Peter's con, you know, it's like having a patient uh, when there's an emergency, consent takes a back seat, but the minute that emergency 
emergency has moved to more of a chronic situation, then consent should never take a back seat. So decisions were made early on that were fast, but they were the right decisions to keep that community safe. And I think there was a lot of uh, targeting of testing, PPEs, um, and, and all sorts of support to make sure that our Indigenous population was really kept supported. Our next question comes from Kieran Simpson. Katie Allen. <coughs> Excuse me. Ever since Julia Banks first heard her story about being bullied, I have wanted her to name names so the constituents of these bullies' electorates can know who they're voting for. I even asked her personally on Q&A once to do this as I really strongly believe they should be held accountable. In Ms Banks' recent interview on 7.30, in my opinion, she implied that she wasn't going to name names because she believes there is no accountability in the government and is scared of the repercussions. Her story is sadly another item in an ever-growing list of serious scandals where no minister has been seriously investigated or held accountable. Why is there no justice for victims, just it seems, men behaving badly? Well, Katie, uh, <laughs> Katie Allen, this is the, uh, the allegation that the former Liberal MP, Julia Banks, has made, that she was touched inappropriately by a Cabinet Minister. She's not naming that Cabinet Minister. Um, firstly, do you believe Julia Banks? Oh, look, I think that, um, absolutely, I think that um, Julia is, um, you know, a political warrior and I think she's a strong woman. Um, and it is interesting, in a normal workplace, what you would do is you'd speak to your supervisor and they'd speak to their supervisor and there'd be a process or there'd be an independent process that would be private and confidential. And both of those things clearly were missing. Uh, it's a bit surprising that Julia respected Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister at the time and she didn't speak to him. So that is disappointing. But, you know, good on her for speaking up now. And it's something that we need to draw a line in the sand and we need to put people on notice that that sort of behaviour in any workplace, whether it's Parliament or right across Australia, is unacceptable and it's just not on. Can you understand, though, someone in that situation, or I suppose any woman, uh, not immediately raising a complaint? These look, things often take Yeah, some time. look, actually, I sat at a dinner table once and the hostess was, you know, basically the guy I sat next to her, sitting next to her, was an old friend, put his hand around and, you know, grabbed her. And um, I was shocked because she didn't say anything. And then afterwards we were cleaning up and she burst into tears. And I thought, oh, she's obviously well behaved. I would have just, you know, told him off then and there. But we were all shocked by that behaviour. So I think clearly what happens when these things happen... People are so taken aback and it's so shocking they, they just don't know what to do. So I do understand her response at the time. Yeah. But I think we need to call out this behaviour and I think, you know, people need to understand those things are just not OK. They're not. This is still a Cabinet Minister in your, your government. Would you like to know who it is? Well, this all happened before I was in Parliament and I don't want to go backwards because I want to fix COVID. I want to fix climate change. Yeah, sure. I want to get on with. I appreciate that. As this a, is a woman cabinet minister. always having to talk about the women's issue, I want to be talking about the issues that are important, which include cultural issues. But the question issues, is about a cabinet not, minister not who is still in cabinet. Surely you'd want to know who that is if they're behaving like this. Well, I think the thing about an independent process is it will allow, in a workplace environment, for the people in that workplace um, to have complaints made against them. And we will be able to see those sorts of behaviours if they are accumulating, not just perhaps a once-off, that if there's an accumulation of experiences, we will, we will know that. And that is going to change uh, the culture. Even just having these processes in place is going to change, and the, has already changed. The process won't To be honest, that has already changed. Simon Birmingham, the Finance Minister, has said this won't... Uh, this case won't go before that new independent body that's being established. Well, I think the thing is that the independent body could keep going backwards and I, w I think we need to make sure that we're going forward. So okay. we want to stop this behaviour. We want this behaviour because people want to see their leaders, uh, you know, reflect themselves in their leaders, but their leaders are held to a higher account. Santilla, let me ask you, do you, do you think uh, Julia Banks should be naming this Cabinet Minister if she's going to raise this issue, raise this allegation? I mean, it depends on the legal risks um, that come with making these sorts of allegations. And I think this is what a lot of women have to consider mm -hmm. when, when thinking about coming forward. I think what I'm curious about is the fact that um, there's still not a lot of account accountability when it comes to these sorts of issues. I mean, Julia Banks is one of a long line of women that have come forward talking about the culture within federal politics and the fact that women still feel unsafe going into work and that these things are still happening and the fact that that incident happened so brazenly, you know, I mean, it didn't surprise me, but at the same time I was like, gosh, this is still happening. Um, and I'd be curious to sort of um, wonder, like, at what point do we start to see 
change because, I mean, Katie talked about, you know, regardless of whether this is happening in Canberra or the rest of the country, it is unacceptable, absolutely, but people model their behaviour from their mm, leaders, correct. right? And if people aren't being held accountable, yeah. how do you expect everyone else in the community correct. to conduct themselves a certain way? And I think that accountability is a first step in yep. this, um, but also ensuring that, you know, there are a lot of young women that um, are interested in entering politics, yep. certainly some that might be watching you tonight, um, and hearing these sorts of accounts might stop people from thinking about about pursuing well, a career in politics. I stood up in the party room and said the very first thing the day after Brittany Higgins, we need to professionalise this place and I need to see procedures and processes around that are going to support that process. And the Kate Jenkins review is welcomed and so is the Stephanie Foster review and those processes are being put in place as we speak. And I'd like to say I've contributed to that. And that is true. We want the young women of Australia to look and say, we want to be in the, the heart of democratic decision making. We want women and men to feel safe in that workplace and we want to be proud of our leaders. I completely agree with you, Cinderella. Malandiri McCarthy, let me, let me ask you about this because, I mean, Kieran's question goes to that issue of accountability, um, you know, when someone going to be held accountable for something like this. I mean, Julia Banks did say, uh, you know, she's not fearless uh, as to why she hasn't named a name here. There are always consequences, she said, in these, in these circumstances. Can you understand her position? Well, I think it's uh, reflective of uh, many women who uh, have experienced uh, some kind of uh, harassment or worse, assault, alleged rape. You wonder whether you come forward. Uh, you only have to look at the statistics across the country, David, uh, for alleged victims uh, who very rarely uh, do get uh, a conclusion that is uh, satisfactory and just uh, in those outcomes. So my concern here, I guess, uh, more deeply, is that when nothing happens, it reinforces the view that uh, your safety as a female at work in the home is not important. So when there is no accountability, uh, I think it leaves Australian women uh, despairing. Let's go to our next question. It's a video from Vivek Thilken in Huntingdale, Victoria. Why does Peter Singer want to publish work that is so controversial that their authors can't put their names to it? All right, well, this is in reference, uh, <laughs> Peter, to your new journal of controversial ideas, which allows contributors to um, uh, publish anonymously. Before I get you to explain that, Cameron, let me get your views on this. Do you think uh, academics or other writers should be able to publish anonymously? Look, I, I do. I mean... Um... The Journal of Controversial I Ideas... I mean, controversial ideas can cause trouble. Um, uh, I covered the um, invasion of the Capitol building in Washington uh, earlier this year. I guess, in a way, that was a response to a controversial idea, which was Donald Trump's notion that he, uh, he actually uh, won the election. But <laughs> we got some I, of the I, pictures, I, in fact, of, of your, your day uh, on that fateful uh -huh. day there at the Capitol, uh, some of the pictures you took uh, of uh, those who were involved in the... Um, and uh, Insurrection. certainly, you know, uh, that's the ultimate expression of a controversial idea where things went badly. But I don't think that the parallel is very good between that and what Peter is suggesting with the journal, because <laughs> Donald Trump's argument that he won the election, as far as I could tell, would never get published in your journal, because I looked at the editorial requirements and you have to have a rational argument, it has to be well argued, and it has to not cause danger to society. <laughs> And those three, on those three bases, I think Donald Trump would fail. So I actually think, generally speaking, that it's a good idea to do this. I mean, I think public discourse, unfortunately, in recent years has become more fractious. Um, you tend to have a bit more groupthink. You have um, social media pylons on minority opinions. And I can understand that, uh, that an academic might fear for their own safety or even their own career if they, if they um, want to put out ideas um, which are not popular. So I, I think I can, I can understand where that comes from, but there's a big rider here, I think, uh, Peter, and that is that um, it's hugely important that your editorial board, and there's about 55 of them as far as I can tell, uh, make correct judgments on precisely what sort of controversial idea you want to publish, because I think there is a genuine difference between a controversial idea that might be unpopular, might even offend a few people, but you're still worth putting out there in the, in the marketplace of ideas, and a, something which is just downright bigotry. Mm. And that's the line I think you have to draw. Do you publish a good, worthwhile article, or do you publish an article that might convince people to write on the Capitol building? Well, Peter, if you're going to publish people under pseudonyms, what are the guardrails around that? 
Well, it is an, it is an academic journal, which means that we send the papers out to peer review, um, as other academic journals do. And so we're sending them out to experts in the field, and they have to look at the argument and say, yes, there's some good argument here, or there's some uh, evidence that is, that is solid. Uh, obviously, Donald Trump's claim that he won the election would not get to first base, didn't even get to first base with Republican officials in Georgia, for example, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's not going to go there. Um, what we really need are, are the strong arguments that, for one reason or another, and it can be from both sides of the political spectrum, people are going to be ideologically opposed to, and they might um, threaten the author, and that certainly happened, you know, personal threats, uh, death threats even, that uh, authors have had. Uh, or they might cause harm to the author's career, um, to a, particularly a, a junior academic who doesn't have a tenured position and needs to get one. Um, and they might be worried that you know, petitions may be written by other academics who oppose the idea, mm. and they may then not be able to have an academic career at all. So that's why we're allowing people to publish under pseudonyms if they wish to do so. They don't have to. Santilla, do you think it's a good idea? No. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Um, right. Tell me why. Not. Why? I, I, think, I think pseudonyms are useful if you fear reprisals. Um, but I think, you know, and David and Cameron will probably know this, you know, when you work in journalism, sometimes even publishing the truth gets people, you know, causes a reaction and people say things and people send threats and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I certainly think that if you're going to have ideas, I think you should stand by them. Um, it happens, you know, even in the arts. Like, when you, when, you, when, you, when you make work publicly, people will have opinions. People will be able to criticise these things. And, and to sort of um, hide behind the facade that, you know, um, the, the, you're potentially afraid that people might not necessarily understand what you're saying or it might have implications for your career, is to, is to sort of look at the world in a very different way um, view because um, I look at what I do for a living and a lot of what I do is not controversial um, but I still get people that feel a certain way, um, feel like they're entitled to, you know, send me racist comments, um, sexist comments, uh, you know, and, and, and this is par for the course. I've accepted this is what it is. When I write work, when I create work publicly, people will have opinions. Sometimes people won't even engage with the work. You know, sometimes they'll just see the clickbaity headline and deduce from that whatever it is that they want to. And, and, and that's, that, that's it. I've just accepted that that's what it is. So I think that if these academics feel that, you know, um, being being able to debate these ideas, I feel like it's a bit of a cop-out because I think that if you are going to be looking at these things and you want people to understand and if the fear is that these ideas might be misinterpreted, then the question I'd be asking is how do you raise the literacy of people to be able to actually understand these ideas that are being debated um, and discussed? And I think that's what I'd, I'd be more curious about rather than sort of going, you know, hide behind a pseudonym um, and therefore you can, you know, pursue controversial ideas. By the way, I find controversial to be a very weasel word. It's well, it can be. But, I mean, you're clearly a strong and courageous person who's prepared to do that and prepared well, it's not to put really about, up there. It, but I don't, I don't think does, it's about courageous. I think if you're a journalist, you either, you know... You, well, I, well, these are not journalists. Ah, these no, are the academics. this is academia. And this they may have good ideas, yeah. but they I, may I be worried but that... But they're still, yeah. they're still sharing these ideas publicly, right? And yes. that, is, that, is, that, is, that is the risk that comes with it. Like I said, you know, when you are bringing things into the public square, people will have opinions. Mm. Oh, sure, but, but should, should they be, have to risk their career in order to put out a worthwhile idea? Should I have to risk my career to, you know, be getting racist comments and sexist comments um, for things that aren't even controversial? It's your choice. If you want to do that, you can, it's, but it's I don't a think... It's a choice for an academic. But, but exactly. Sure, so, yeah. I, like, I, 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 I just don't know. I, I just feel like it's a bit of a cop-out, honestly. Like, I, I understand what you're saying, and I don't disagree... I, I, I disagree to a certain extent, um, but I, I largely think that if you're going to be debating these ideas, um, I think you have to stand by them. The thing is with ideas, it's not just what is said, it's who says it. And so in my academic world, we used to have round tables where we get people to put ideas on post-it notes and put them up on walls so that the idea could have ascendancy. Uh, because sometimes the most junior person would have this amazing idea, but they would be nervous to say it with someone who had, you know, power over them or, you know, was more senior. And a senior person putting it up, we know over and over again in science, often the most senior people, you know, have this strong and powerful voice when actually what you want to do, do is democratise that academic intent. So I'm very much with Peter Singer about academia because it's about playing the idea and not the person. What well, about social when it media? Comes to should, personal should you be allowed to commentary? post on social media? And that's honestly? where it comes to personal commentary. I disagree with that. I think people behind keyboard warriors, they're playing the person and not the ball. 
But and so there is a difference. The academia, yeah, there's yeah. guardrails, there's an academic intent. That's different from personal commentary, and I think personal commentary should not be de-anonymised. Okay, but then it sounds like it's more the bias that you're trying to curb then, less, less so... <laughs> So, so, so in, in academia, I think the issue is that, that, that there, there, there is a contest of ideas, and if you, de, de, you know, if you anonymise and de-identify that, then it allows those contests of ideas to become separated from the person who is saying them. And I spend a lot of time teaching my PhD students that very much that discipline, to be able to be objective about the idea and not be emotional about We've got to move on. We've got to move on. The next question is a video, and it comes from Lisa Stefanoff in Darwin. My question is for Mal and Deary. Is the gas-fired recovery plan for the Northern Territory and the Australian economies a good idea? Senator. Uh, thank you for the question, Lisa. And uh, I'd have to say what is a really good idea is that uh, traditional owners have a voice in whatever it is that takes place, whether it's to do uh, with uh, gas in the Northern Territory or whether it's to do with farming, whether it's to do with business. And that's actually where my focus is. Uh, but to go to your question, one of the things we did uh, in the Senate recently was to establish a Senate committee inquiry into the Beedaloo region, because we do want to, as the Senate, uh, understand what is taking place out there and try and uh, ensure and embrace uh, the importance of all stakeholders having a say uh, on that committee. But what's your view, Senator? You're an elected senator. Do you back fracking in the Beetaloo Basin? Well, this is a really, really good question because in the Northern Territory, the Australian Labor Party of the Territory branch had said no to fracking. And then the uh, steps went along with uh, the Gunner government uh, putting forward the Pepper Inquiry, which examined uh, what fracking would look like. And that was a recommendation of the Gunner uh, executive government. And I know that there were concerns uh, also within the Australian Labor Party of the Northern Territory, but also uh, traditional owners who really wanted to ensure that fracking didn't take place. So what's your view? Now, just, just to be clear, I'm, what's yeah, your view? I'm, I'm coming to it. I'm, I'm a Yanua Gado woman from Borrelula in the Gulf Country. I have seen the damage that's been done in terms of uh, mining in the Gulf Country and the diversion of the MacArthur River uh, over lead and zinc. And I have grave concerns around what fracking could do in the Northern Territory. All right. Our next uh, final question, in fact, comes from Michael Burke. Thanks, David. <coughs> um, my question is to the panel. Um, pork barrelling corrupts not just the people uh, and wastes not just the money directly involved, but it corrupts the whole decision-making process of government, um, thereby reducing its social licence um, and um, eroding its mandate to pursue other sort of you know, areas of its, of its agenda, such as health and medicine. Um, my question is, uh, how would you justify the spending of $660 million of public money on a car park slush fund um, developed with no due process and announced by the PM's office the day before caretaker conventions kicked in prior to the last election? Katie, Alan... <laughs> You might be relieved that the clock's ticking and we're, we are running out of time here at the end of the program. But, look, the Auditor-General's report on this car park fund was a doozy. How do you justify it? Well, I suppose the first thing to say is that, um, uh, you know, car parks, getting cars off the road, uh, getting people on public transport, I'm, I actually back that in. And I also back in the fact that... Um, I don't think anyone's questioning that there is a need. So there was a need, you know, there is a need for those car parks. Yeah, the, those the problem parks. here is that the, the Auditor-General found this was demonstrably not merit-based. Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, there's a large amount of infrastructure that was being spent and some of... I don't know, if, is that true, that they said it's completely this not merit-based? Yes, said it was demonstrably not merit-based, the program was not effective, the, the decisions were not open and transparent. It's a damning report. Right, well, I haven't read the specifics of the report. That definitely sounds damning, I have to say. Um, but what I would say is that... I mean, my understanding is that there is infrastructure that needs to be built and we want to make sure that that infrastructure is being spent in the correct way. And it is true that... Um, you know, the perceptions that people have about the way money is spent can undermine trust and integrity in the government. And that was in the previous parliament. But what I would say is that 
you know, any, any possibility I have to get involved, it's to make sure that there is due and proper process. And I think we do need to do better in so many ways when we, when we come to spending the taxpayers' money. But that being said, is I understand that there was a number of weeks and months before that process. So I don't know if it was just well, an overnight most, most of the projects were decided the day before the Well, there was $7 billion the and $2 billion for the Melbourne Airport Rail and the Geelong Fast yeah, we're, Trains. We're talking about this project, though. Just, well. just quickly, Peter Singer, just on this, this one, it's another example, I suppose, isn't it, of... Um, what elected governments think they can they can do, they can get away with, should taxpayers at the very least expect merit-based spending? Absolutely they should. I think that's a clear ethical requirement and, and it is very corrupting, in fact, because once one party does it when in office, then the others will say, well, we can do that too, it'll give us a political advantage and the result is a, a downward spiral of, of public morality and public integrity and I think it's really important for everyone to fight that and I'm pleased to hear Katie saying that she's not going to support it uh, whether it's her political party or any other. I think that's... I'd like to hear more members of parliament taking that view. On that note, uh, we will leave it there. That's all we have time for. Would you please thank our panel? Santilla Chinga Ipe, Katie Allen, Peter Singer, Cameron Stewart and from Darwin, Malandiri McCarthy. And thank you all for your questions tonight. Next week, Virginia Trioli will be in the chair filling in, hosting live from Melbourne. I'll see you Sunday morning for a special 20th anniversary edition of Insiders. Good night.